Mr. Perdon and Mrs. Keene, are we ready to begin the board meeting? Thank you. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is a public hearing. The public hearing held by the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board is called to order and has been held pursuant to KRS Chapter 77 and district regulations. Notice of this hearing has been published pursuant to state law. This public hearing is being held by video teleconference. Instructions on making written and oral statements by video conference have been distributed to everyone. All statements must be or statements must be presented today. Statements should be concise. All statements will become a part of the operating record or the hearing record. There is one agreed board order to be reviewed today. Would the staff please review the uh, agreed board order with Carbide Industry LLC? Thank you. Chairman Hilton, board members, the district ranks for the board's consideration an agreement with Carbide Industries LLC, which operates a manufacturing facility on Bells Lane. The facility produces calcium chloride or carbide and is subject to a district issued Title V permit. The district alleges that Carbide failed to perform required monitoring and record keeping of their operation during 2020 and 2021 and did not include all required information in their periodic compliance reports. During the first half of 2022, district compliance engineer David Becker conducted a full compliance review of the company, including an on site inspection and multiple rounds of records requests. During this investigation, it was determined that the records for the control devices were not being kept as required by the Title V permit. Missing records included daily baghouse pressure drop readings and daily scrubber exhaust temperature readings. Records that were kept for these control devices showed them operating outside of the ranges listed in the permit. The company also failed to include these deviations from compliance in their periodic compliance reports as required by the permit. After the district issued the notice of violation for these instances of non-compliance, Carbide had a third party conduct a review of their control devices and work to establish corrected pressure drop ranges for the equipment. A report of their findings and an application to modify their permit was submitted to the district in February and a new permit was issued in April. The district provided a 30 day public comment period for this proposed agreed board order from May 10th to June 9th, 2023 and did not receive any comments. The company has agreed to pay a penalty of $40,500 to resolve this notice of violation. The district recommends the board adopt this order as written. Thank you. Mrs. King has a representative of Carbide Industries registered to make a statement this morning. Ms. King, as a member of the public, registered to make a floor uh, statement this morning. Has any member of the public submitted a written statement? Are there any members of the public in the Edison room this morning that wish to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Are there any other members of the public that wish to make a brief comment on this video teleconference? Please raise your hand by video teleconference and you will be called on. There is a feature you can find on the participant list of our present star three. If joined by phone and you will be called upon. So no one has indicated they want to say anything. I see no raised hand. Thank you. Uh, does anyone uh, wish to uh, speak? Are there any questions by board members? Step one question. I wonder whether uh, when this equipment operates uh, on specifications, whether there are any alarms uh, raised indicating this might open mediate problem. So they may have implemented that going forward, but at the time there were not. There were not. I have one question on the uh, semi-annual, or I guess the annual compliance certification. Is that um, someone from the official plant manager is supposed to sign those? Uh, and you, yes. So in the past, no one from the um, official like plant manager above signed those? So. so they were signed by the plant manager, but they didn't include the uh, information that things were operating out of range and record keeping had not been done. 
Okay. They provide explanation as to why. They did. Do they? <laughs> yeah. So he just signed the uh, forms. Uh, I, I'm unaware of their <laughs> okay. process on. Okay. Their review. Yeah. Because uh, I would just uh, when I was reading through the uh, your uh, summary of the uh, report. Uh, this uh, company is um, it's a Title V, so you had to go back and revise the Title V to incorporate these changes, right? Yes, they've, they've been issued a constructive permit that modifies the language for those. And the next Title V issuance will include the changes that were done in the construction. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? If not, uh, this uh, concludes the uh, public meeting, public hearing. Moving on, I will now call the regular meeting of the local uh, Metro Air Pollution Control Board to order. We are conducting the monthly board meeting today by video teleconference. First thing on the agenda, uh, to see if we have a uh, quorum, I will conduct a roll call of board members that are present on this teleconference. When I call your name, please say here. Uh, 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 Steve Sullivan. Here. Dr. Colbert. Here. here. Dr. May. Here. Thank you. Uh, Candace White. Let's see. It's not okay. Marissa Neal. Here. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Gorse. Yes. Here. Thank you. Oh, she just showed up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi, Chairman Hilton. Yes, I've been here. However, I wasn't promoted until just now. I've been here since 953. I just wanted that put it to the record. We have to try to promote our board members before the meeting starts, please. Thank you. Apologies. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. Um, Mrs. Hampton, do we have any uh, introductions this morning? Not this morning. Any uh, public recognitions this morning? Not this morning. Okay. Uh, approval of minutes. Uh, we had the um, the regular uh, meeting uh, held on uh, May 17th, 2023. We're distributed electronically uh, for your review. Are there any changes to the minutes by board members? Not for me. Sure. Any uh, questions or Comments regarding the uh, regular uh, meeting uh, minutes. Thank you. Uh, can I get a second to uh, after uh, second? All those in favor of the uh, said motion, let it be known. Say aye. 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 Thank you. Minutes of the regular meeting. Um, Chairman. Term. I'm sorry. Um, there, there was also public. Yeah, public I was going to go to the yeah. Uh, somehow it was left off the uh, sheet. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we did because we had the the, the regular meeting and the uh, public meeting. So now we will go to the uh, public meeting that was held on uh, May 17, uh, 2023. We're distributed electronically for your review. Are there any changes to the minutes by board members regarding the? Um, Public meeting, public hearing that was held. Not for me. Okay. Get a second to uh, motion to uh, second. Okay. Minutes, second. Are there uh, any questions? Not. All those in favor say aye. 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 Minutes. Thank you. Minutes of the uh, regular meeting and public uh, hearing. Uh, stand approved. Thank you. Mrs. Keene, has anyone registered to make a uh, comment this morning? As when has anyone provided written comments this morning? Okay, thank you. Are there any members of the public in the Edison room that wish to make a comment? If so, please raise your hand. Are there any other members of the public that wish to make a brief comment on this video teleconference? Please raise your hand. 
by video teleconference, you will be called upon. This is a feature you can find on your participant list or by pressing star three if joining the following. If you will, you will be called upon. We have communication. Thank you. Uh, does anyone um, wish to speak? Well, that completes the uh, comment uh, portion of the meeting. Unfinished business. There is no unfinished business this morning. Uh, new business. We have the agreed board order with Carbide Industries, LLC. The district has recommended that the board adopt the agreed board order with Carbide Industries, LLC. Is there a motion to adopt a agreed board order with Carbide Industries, LLC? So moved. Second. I'll second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion from board members? <laughs> I will now take a roll call vote. Uh, if you uh, will vote yes or no, if you wish to adopt the agreed board order with Corbett uh, Industry, either say yes or no. Steve Sullivan. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Colbert? Yeah. Yes. Dr. May? Yes. Okay. Candace White? Yes. Thank you. Marissa Neal? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Garsh? Yes. Thank you. And myself. Please. The great the uh, reboard order of carbine industry is adopted and approved. Thank you. Next thing on the agenda, um, committee reports. I don't think any uh, committee met uh, within the last month. So we're down to uh, staff report. Uh, Ms. Hampton, um, you have the uh, director's report for us. Thank you, Chair. Oh. Trying to look as we begin, I'd like to introduce everyone to Deputy Mayor Nicole George. She is the chair of the Public Health and Safety <laughs> Group of Little Metro Government. We 20 bucks for the mayor, I think it's eight million dollars. Board members, if you and those in attendance, if you could just check and be sure that your uh, mics are muted. Okay. So, Chairman Hill, mm -hmm. board members, welcome to the first day of summer. It is a pleasure to be here on the first day, the longest day of the year, the shortest night, the summer solstice. It is at least the first day of summer from the calendar's point of view. We've already seen a fair amount of summer in terms of heat dry weather. And later in this morning's presentation, my colleague Brian Harris, APCD's data analyst and quality assurance air toxic supervisor, will be sharing a presentation on how that weather, the Canadian wildfire smoke, impacted people's air quality. So even though it is the first day of summer, I am grateful for today's rain. Uh, with the recent summer-like temperatures and low rainfall, we've seen an increase in odor complaints particularly from neighborhoods in West Lowell. As most are aware, sewer odors come from both the Water Quality Treatment Center and the combined stormwater sewer system. Through uncapped patch basins, vented manhole covers, disconnected downspouts, and other pieces of infrastructure. As this board is aware, odors coming from the Metropolitan Sewer District's Morris Foreman Water Quality Treatment Center as well as the combined sewer system, are the subject of an enforcement action and an agreed board order that required, among other things, MSD develop and implement a countywide odor control master plan and odor communications plan. That they clean and provide maintenance to all the catch basins within the collection system by the end of 2022, and that they focus specifically on repairing untracked catch basins and then providing an annual report to the board until they are able to fully repair the system. In March, MSD updated the board on their efforts to repair catch basins to date. In recent conversations with MSD on how best to mitigate odors in the meantime, they reported some delays in their plan to uh, repair catch basins, particularly those in the California neighborhood. 
which they had hoped to complete within fiscal year 2023. They've now indicated that that's going to be delayed into fiscal year 2024 while they wait on some federal funding. A copy of their update has been provided to the board. We've also posted a copy of that update into the materials for today's meeting on our website. I know it's asking a lot of the community, but we encourage residents to continue reporting odors. They can report those to the district through a variety of means, phone call, web, person, through the Smell My City app, or, or in addition to, they also reach out to MSD by calling them directly because they can take steps such as flushing uh, sewer lines to mitigate odors. Are there any questions about that report? Seems a not have any kind of time frame estimates. Was it this? The estimates that are in there go through the California neighborhood projects, the projects uh, related to the Shawnee and Chickasaw neighborhoods. There is not a time frame expressed in that letter. I have one question around the air quality in the last two weeks. I've been reading reports in the Philadelphia and New York newspapers that they had a substantial increase in people going to the emergency room, asthma, and respiratory problems. Have you heard of anything in the rural area or Jefferson County area? So I'm not aware of any increased uh, public health related admissions due to that wildfire smoke. Uh, there were substantial concentrations of particulate matter, particularly in New York City. Mm -hmm. They had some elevated readings up to 460 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Our standard here locally, you know, nationally is 12 micrograms per cubic meter for an annual standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter for a uh, 24 hour average. Mm -hmm. 490. That's a lot. That's beyond uh, Beijing, it's beyond Bangalore. It is a lot. Brian Harris will be talking about okay. how those wildfires showed up here in Louisville at the end of my presentation. So moving on, as the board is aware, the district is authorized under KRS Chapter 77 as a separate public body corporate and a political subdivision of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We're a related agency under the local metro ordinances. The board is our regulatory authority. Local metro government is our administrative and fiscal administrator, and that includes human resources. For the district, we receive about 10% of our budget from the general fund. So we're always interested in the Metro budget process, but this year, especially so since we participated in Metro's enterprise wide compensation study last fall. For HR, the study is intended to ensure that Volvo is competitive in the market for salaries in comparison to cities that are similar uh, to Louisville. And the compensation study is intended to have captured data for current employees to look at internal and external inequities and provide recommendations ultimately for appropriate implementation along with a better process to evaluate positions in the future. Turn on the podcast and video outside from this room and not just asking you to see if we can fix that. We see ourselves here, but others can't see us. With the board's permission, we'll take a break for a moment. Yes. Should we work on that? Yes, that'd be great. Okay, I can now see video again on the remote systems. Chairman Hilton, it appears that we're now broadcasting, but it appears the chat feature this morning is not working appropriately. There is a Q&A function. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to raise your hand or to send us a like to be admitted to ask a question through that question and answer feature and then we'll follow up. So back to budget comp study and staffing here. Uh, it's our understanding that the fiscal year 2024 budget will include implementation of the recommendations from the compensation study. 
I don't have a whole lot of information on that. Uh, this is an enterprise wide led process by. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Back in good order. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Thank you, Candace. All right. So back to our presentation. So at this point, Patrick Ugaji, one of our compliance officers and one of our newest staff members, completed his master's in sustainability. He's taken a job uh, with an agency in Washington, D.C., where his wife will also be pursuing a master's. That leaves our remaining compliance officers. We have three. They are a well dedicated group of individuals who've given extraordinary service to the local metro government, and they are all now at a retirement age and a little bit plus in some cases. They're going to be leaving us over the summer. So we have a fair amount of hiring to do here at the agency. We also have a moratorium while HR implements recommendations from the compensation study. That moratorium will last through July 9th. So look for postings to be uh, on the local Metro government career website thereafter. And we're really looking forward uh, to adding new staff, bringing in new people to grow them in this field. To be candid, you know, the district has some really nifty equipment, uh, but our product, if you will, is really the best professional judgment of work here. From people who acquire and analyze air monitoring data, develop innovative programs, regulatory proposals, those who take that regulation and implement it through permitting, ensure compliance, respond to complaints, enforcement. That is our stock in trade, and it really takes a very sustained uh, workforce to do that. There's no one here in the building who just the Clean Air Act. It's too big for any of us to really understand how it all works well, to rely on each other. So attracting, developing, and retaining highly qualified air pollution professionals like my colleagues so that the district can continue to provide its excellent service to Louisville, it's a critical concern. Sometimes that's the one that keeps me up at night the most. I hope to provide an update to the board on the results of the compensation study at the July or August board meeting. Forward to that. In the meantime, the full Metro Council will consider the fiscal year 2024 capital and operating budget tomorrow night at 6 p.m. The materials for that meeting are available on the Metro Council's website. Moving on to more air pollution related matters. As you know, the local statistical area is meeting all, I'm sorry, Carl, did you have a question? No, I just, um, how many staff members have you lost in the last year? In the last year? Seemed like you at least lost at least four in the last. Four now. Four weeks. Four. So, a turnover, we hold on. So we have a special group in Metro government that looks at diversity and do they reach outside of Jefferson County or how does that work? Thank you so much. Um, our postings, we actually ask that they be posted for uh, three weeks instead of the usual two weeks that okay. allows for services outside of Metro's career website like uh, Career Finder and other external career finding groups to pick up that posting. Right, okay. That helps. In the past, we've reached out to the uh, University of Louisville, some HBCUs, uh, and now Metro HR has indicated that they'll help us by having a portal by which we can okay. widely disseminate our uh, postings without having to do it on an ad hoc basis. Okay. So, righty. Um, Our area is meeting all of the national and ambient air quality standards based on the monitor date. More or less. Uh, on April 18th, EPA proposed redesignating the area to attainment. The public comment period on that proposal ended on May 18th. 
EPA has received three comments that are available in the docket for the rulemaking, raising concerns in part over how emission reductions, if any, from COVID may have influenced the 2020 ambient air monitoring data. That data is part of the three year design value used in the district's request for redesignation. EPA Region 4 is reviewing these comments and they will respond to them in their final determination, which may take place later this summer or early fall. I don't have a definitive time frame from EPA, although we have talked since those comments have been received. Now, once we talk about redesignation, RFG comes to everyone's mind. That's reformulated gas. So here's a quick reminder. In March 2023, the General Assembly passed House Joint Resolution 37. It actually supersedes previous House Joint Resolution 8. In that Resolution 37, the General Assembly asks, asks EPA to expeditiously review and approve the request to redesignate the Louisville Area to Attainment for Ozone. It directs the district, the Kentucky Division for Air Quality, those revisions to the state implementation plan to remove RNG gas in Jefferson, Bullard, and Bullard counties, and if necessary, implement other air pollution control strategies to achieve equivalent or greater reductions to offset emission reductions that we receive from RFG. It also requires the district and the cabinet to provide a status update to the Interim Joint Committee on Natural Resources and Energy by October 31st of 2023. Redesignation is a threshold step for removing RFG. So in the meantime, we've prepared a draft proposal to remove that control measure. We're reviewing it internally. We'll be sharing it with our counterparts at the Kentucky Division for Air Quality with portions of Bullitt and Boulder County State regularly. And so that we can timely submit it to EPA when we are redesignated to a team. So the the state legislature bill was that contingent upon redesignation. It at this point allows us to pursue that as our control strategy. In order to remove RFG while we're in non-attainment requires us to find permanent surplus enforceable quantifiable emission reductions. And today we don't have any of that type of emission bank available to us. So we would be, uh, if we are in non-attainment and we're required to remove our G, it would require emission reduction. So I guess my question is, the state require you to remove RFG regardless? Not at this point. Okay. We are waiting on redesignation. And once we have that, then there is an understanding that we will move to remove RFG based on the demonstration that it's appropriate to do so, which the district believes we can make. At the end of the day, the, the decision to remove RFG isn't the district's and it isn't the cabinet's, it's US EPA's. Any other questions on that? I just got one question on this reformulated gas. You know, we got rid of the uh, inspections and you can pull up a service station and you see folks don't have gas caps on their own. On the gas tanks, uh, it just then do we still uh, inspect the uh, vapor recovery at the service station? Is that still in place or what? So we removed requirements for stage two vapor recovery a few years ago. That was on a demonstration of widespread use of the fleet cars themselves having onboard vapor recovery systems. Right. My current car and my prior. The 2012 Ford Focus and now a 2021 Honda Civic, they don't have gas caps in the car. Oh, they don't? They don't. Oh. <laughs> they don't think that. They didn't they complain about something I don't know about. That on the recovery recovery system. Oh, okay. Well, exactly. 2006, that's part of the reason why. The onboard paper recovery system <laughs> okay. now takes things okay. to capturing those emissions, uh, which okay. is benefit for the environment and for the driver. Thank you. So, Couple things uh, that are currently out for public comment, I'd like to raise uh, to the board of public's attention. One is the 1997 maintenance plan, and this is available on the district's proposed actions page. Under the Clean Air Act, eight years after an area is redesignated to attain a second maintenance plan demonstrating a 
continued attainment for an additional 10 years after the initial 10 year maintenance period has to be submitted to EPA. Bottom line here is it's to prevent us from backsliding for a standard that has been repealed, but we want to keep improving air quality and not seeing any uh, reversions. The district has prepared the second maintenance plan and it is posted on our proposed actions website for public comment. The public written comment period ends on July 7th. And if requested, a public hearing will be held on July 19th before the board's regular meeting. Any questions on that? Okay. Finally, our network plan is also posted for public review. This is the Kentucky Annual Ambient Air Monitoring Network Plan. Uh, this is required under federal regulations. It's required that every year we put it out for public review of both the district's air monitoring plan. Those are the five sites that we operate here in Jefferson County. The sites operated by the Kentucky Division for Air Quality and a site operated by the National Park Service uh, in Horse Cave, Cape City. Thank you. There's a panel. So the annual monitoring network plan details the operation and location of ambient air monitors operated by three entities. And we really invite people to review that document. It lays out the type of equipment that we're operating at each site, the purpose for the monitoring and its scale. Um, once that public comment period ends on the 23rd, the annual plan and any comments that are received on it will be sent off to US EPA for their review and concurrence. We typically hear back from them uh, usually around October. Any questions on that? All right. So in the past two weeks, district staff have been very busy working with two different teams of EPA researchers on two separate projects using sensor technology that was developed and tested here in Louisville as part of EPA's Regional Applied Research Effort or RARE project. Uh, those of you who are on the board, it started back in 2017. If you're not familiar with that work, we have a web page that goes through and all. The first project led by Dr. Evan Toma is a project to install some now commercially available SPOD sensors to evaluate volatile organic compounds for a district-led project. Second project, led by Dr. Rochelle Duval with Dr. Avery George, is a 30 day pilot project to test an odor app coupled with a pre placed, a remotely activated sensor at Kennedy Montessori and Stephen Foster Elementary Schools. The district will be reporting on sensors, including some in use by community groups, these sensor projects, and our own work with sensors at the July board meeting. We'll also be introducing our co-location shelter. This is located at our Cannons Lane in Port site. The district is one of nine uh, air pollution control agencies in EPA region four and six to have a co-location shelter where air sensors are placed near regulatory instruments and they're operated at the same time and under the same conditions to evaluate how that sensor forms compared to our regulatory monitor and even against one another. From that information, when we have a known data quality, we can help evaluate important parameters such as accuracy, precision, and bias, and if needed, help develop correction equations to improve sensor data accuracy. So stay tuned for that. We will be talking about that in the July board meeting. Any questions before I move on? Our engagement work continues and we really continue uh, enjoying meeting the community face to face. We've had a number of opportunities uh, to join end of the year school celebrations, meet and greets with Metro Council members, uh, block parties, including the Park Duval Community Health Center party this past Saturday. And we presented uh, on smoke impacts last night at the West Jefferson County Task Force meeting, separately on the proposed hazardous organic niching Amendments at last night's Sierra Club meeting. Looking forward, we'll be participating in Mayor Green's, Greenberg's next Mayor's Night Out on June 27th from 5:30 to 7:30 at the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage on West Muhammad Ali Boulevard. That leads me to my last uh, item here. 
And that is the plethora of federal rulemakings that we have seen come down the pike in the last three months. Um, public participation is the hallmark of environmental regulation. We invite people to comment on our work. We try to make the opportunity for people to comment as easy as possible. We know uh, it is difficult. We try to watch our language so that it's clear, avoid jargon when possible, um, really make it, I hope, a little easier for people to share their thoughts with us on things that are happening locally. EPA issues the same invitation, but when they put out one, two, three, four, five, six, six major rules in three months, many of those are thousands of pages long, uh, it feels a little bit less inviting uh, for those of us who have to read them. And it is very important for us to read these proposals because they let us know planning perspective what may happen to control, for example, mobile source emissions. Our monitors don't care where the air pollution comes from. They don't distinguish between a stationary source, which we regulate, or a mobile source, which we don't. But that state implementation plan is based on addressing the monitor's data, not what we can regulate. So understanding how uh, rules such as the greenhouse gas emission standards for heavy duty vehicles uh, or the multi pollutant light medium duty vehicle emission standards help us understand how additional reductions in criteria points may take place with those mobile sources. That's a helpful thing for us. Similarly, with the greenhouse gas standards for fossil fuel power plants, EPA has extended the deadline for that rulemaking until August the 8th. So since we haven't had a chance to fully read that or even have conversations with our counterparts nationally, we'll be bringing more information about that rulemaking to the board in July. The rulemaking for the plum or the hazardous organic niche app, including the standards for synthetic organic chemical plants, polymers, and resin plants, has been extended. Its original deadline was Monday, June 26. The deadline for that has now been extended to July 7. Many of um, us in the district have been on calls with our state and national counterparts looking at these rules. And typically, unless we have a very localized concern, we issue comments through our advocacy organizations, um, the Association for Air Pollution Control Agencies and the National Association for Clean Air and Clean Air Agencies. So we're still taking a look at whether we will be making comments. Uh, not sure it's helpful helpful uh, to let EPA know that we appreciate being invited to comment on these, but then one at a time um, would be helpful for us in our own work. Do you anticipate so, having comments that are localized could be one? So the hazardous organic niche app, you know, it affects uh, 220 facilities across the nation. Four of those are here, I believe. And there may be some opportunity for us to provide comment. Um, you know, it's a big rule. And in terms of why it was that tall. Uh -huh, it is. You know, it, its most uh, timely feature is that in a year it will require uh, next line monitoring for several facilities. And that's a place where I believe there are still some revisions needed uh, to the monitoring method or some of the chemicals. So encouraging EPA to expeditiously undertake that rulemaking so that they are on time um, being able to complement this particular fence line monitoring part. That would be a comment that we may make. Separately, the work practice standards and some of the other equipment requirements uh, that go into place, those take place three years after adoption. So I don't know whether some in the community may wish uh, to note to EPA that that time frame uh, is either acceptable or not. Any other questions? Well, did, I do. On the budget, um, how does the budget that's going to council compare to the current budget? So APCD receives about 10% of our funding from the Metro Council. The balance of our funding comes from 
our federal 105 grant that supports the day to day operations of the district. And also our federal 103 grant, uh, which is for particulate matter and other air monitoring work. The balance comes from program emissions and permit fees. So we, we actually fund the balance. Well, I'm actually talking about the dollar amount. The city's 10% compared to the new proposed 10%. It is it's an interesting issue. It did go. Okay. We're always happy about that. Okay. So, any other questions? Um, this one regarding the uh, Title Five uh, program fees. Does that does that increase automatically every year? Do you look at the inflation? All of our fees uh, are adjusted annually by the Consumer Price okay. Index. Uh, that at least keeps us even with inflation. Good. With that, if there are no other questions, I really appreciate everyone's patience today with our technology issues. Brian Ferris, our data analyst and quality assurance air toxic supervisor, is going to present on the slope. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Holden. Good morning, board members. Uh, as Director Henderson said, my name is Brian Paris. I'm a data analyst and one of the monitoring uh, one of the supervisors in the ambient air monitoring group here at ABC. And I will talk a little bit about the uh, smoke impact that we've seen with the Canadian wildfires. Next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, just a little overview. So, I'll give uh, an overview of the Canadian wildfires. I'll uh, show some maps of um, where that smoke um, has impacted uh, areas of the U.S. and um, talk a little bit about some air quality forecasting and communicating uh, these complex uh, smoke impacts. I think we'll, we'll end this Q and A discussion. Next slide, please. So these are the three kind of main areas um, in Canada that have seen uh, some enhanced uh, fire activity in the last couple of months. So in, in Western Canada, it's kind of the epicenter there is the province of Alberta. Uh, that's where some of the fires started um, almost a month and a half ago. Uh, they've had uh, extreme heat there um, in, in May and that, that certainly uh, dried out the vegetation and helped those fires be uh, quite intense and numerous. Um, and then in Eastern Canada and the province of Quebec, uh, that was an area that kind of flared up a little bit later. And then um, there was another uh, kind of secondary area in Ontario there that had um, some fairly significant impacts of the fires as well. And, uh, and the accumulation of, of smoke from those different areas has, has impacted a large area of the U.S. and the Midwest. Next slide, please. So, uh, because of those fires, uh, we have seen intermittent smoke impacts here in Louisville and across uh, the region uh, since about mid May. So, going on over a month now. On and on. Uh, these smoke impacts have varied based on atmospheric wind patterns. Um, we've seen uh, those, those. Kind of upper level winds that steer a lot of the smoke. Um, we've seen a lot of those winds come from the general northerly direction in the last month. And so that's why we've seen um, a pretty uh, widespread uh, time frame of, of these smoke impacts. Uh, those impacts can kind of come in a, a few different forms. Uh, that smoke can stay high in the atmosphere, um, and those impacts will come more visually. Uh, so hazy skies and, you know, you might see some enhanced sunsets from that smoke high up in the atmosphere. Um, so while it may look hazy, we might not necessarily be seeing the smoke here at the surface. So, you know, might not necessarily breathing that in and measuring that in monitors. Of course, we've certainly seen our share of, of smoke that has reached the surface. Of course, that's the air that we breathe. That's the air, um, the air that we measure with our monitors. And um, so it can really be a mixture of. Uh, smoke near the surface, uh, smoke high in the atmosphere, and in and, and all areas in between. Uh, in addition to the particulate pollution and uh, some 
maybe some VOCs as well that comes from these the smoke. Uh, that smoke can also enhance ozone concentrations. Um, we've seen some elevated ozone in the last uh, couple of weeks. That's been a combination of uh, some warm, uh, dry conditions, which um, uh, typically is favorable for ozone production. Um, but that smoke has uh, possibly enhanced um, some of that ozone as well. So, um, you know, we routinely provide air quality forecasting. We partner with uh, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management and provide daily forecasts. When we see some of these regional events, such as the smoke impacts, we um, try to dig in a little deeper and provide a little more detail. We'll share, uh, Matt will share some of that information uh, on our website, through Twitter, through different social media. Uh, as with any forecast, um, you know, the forecast isn't always, we're not going to nail it perfectly every single day. Um, so we definitely encourage folks to uh, stay in touch with uh, near real time data through our Global Air Watch site, as well as um, the, the EPA Air Now site, which has real time data for particulate pollution and, uh, and ozone. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just a couple examples of some of the forecasting tools that, that we have available. Uh, these are smoke models. Uh, they're essentially sophisticated meteorological models that also incorporate um, satellite detections of fires and um, estimate uh, emission pollutants from those fires. So uh, with those emission estimates, the kind of meteorological part of the model will uh, forecast you know, what direction that smoke is, is heading, what levels of the atmosphere that smoke is um, projected to, to be within. So again, it could be high up in the atmosphere, down near the surface. These two pictures here, the one on the left, that is showing um, smoke that is throughout all levels of the atmosphere and, and maybe, you know, more concentrated than the upper levels. Whereas the image on the right is a near surface smoke. Uh, projection. So you can see this, these two models are for the exact same time frame. So you can basically see that during this time frame, uh, I think this was back in mid May. Um, basically, you had smoke that was present both higher in the atmosphere and near the surface in, say, the north central plains and kind of southwest Canada. But that area of, of fairly dense smoke that's in the upper atmosphere over the Midwest, uh, that smoke was not, not much of it was reaching the surface at that point. So that again might be an, a, a time where you see those hazy skies, um, but not a whole lot of impact at the surface. So these forecasts for a couple of days in advance? These generally forecast 48 hours out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Next slide, please. And, um, this is another tool available. So this is the EPA fire and smoke map. And um, this was uh, from a similar time frame as what those models were just showing before. So uh, this is from May 18. Uh, those gray uh, areas are the uh, kind of analysis of where the smoke was present. Uh, again, that could be high up in the atmosphere, down near the surface. Uh, all the Dots there are uh, ambient air quality monitors, and um, you, we can see at this time smoke was present throughout, you know, the whole northern U.S. basically. But at that time, that smoke was reaching the surface, uh, say in the northern plains where you see a lot of those red dots. Uh, but here in the Midwest, at that time, a lot of green, indicating that the air quality of the surface was actually okay at that time. Next slide, please. Here's just a kind of a quick summary of um, what we've seen for the last month. So uh, these are PM 2.5 AQI values from mid-May through uh, my day, I think. And a lot of uh, a lot of yellow in there, especially the last two weeks. Um, I think that's the moderate range of the AQI. And in a few days, we did uh, reach into the unhealthy for sensitive groups category. Uh, the that first group of yellow bars, so that was uh, that was the kind of first impact that we saw, and, and that was from smoke in those from those western fires in Canada. Uh, after several days of impacts there, we did kind of clear out the atmosphere. Uh, wind patterns shifted, 
Uh, it did clear out some of that smoke, but then you know we kind of got another uh, prolonged period of, of smoke impacts. And that that second period is um, that was more from the fires in Quebec uh, and in, in Ontario as well. Yes. In two point five years. Uh, Fine particles, so particles uh, 2.5 microns in diameter and smaller. So those are the, the smallest particles that can really kind of, when you breathe in, can kind of get deep, deeper down into your lungs. We do measure PM10 as well, slightly larger particles, but smoke is um, typically comprised of those smallest particles. And Brian, would you say upper atmosphere is compared to lower atmosphere? What height are you talking about? Um, it's it really, you know, mid atmosphere might be more appropriate uh, than when I say upper atmosphere. It's the, the, the models do have certain uh, indicators that will indicate what actual you know, elevation we're talking about above the ground. Um, it'll certainly vary, but uh, I mean, generally speaking, we're probably talking uh, above 5,000. Ten thousand, and certainly can get up up to thirty thousand feet as well. I think thirty thousand feet is typically where the planes will fly. So, but um, anywhere from probably five to thirty thousand feet, but it can it can, it can vary. I think that's one reason the jet stream to bring us uh, fire down here in the United States because of the uh, altitude jet stream. Yeah, the, I mean, the jet stream, those mid-level kind of level wind patterns, is what's steering. Yeah. The how do these values relate to the report that we're getting you know, that shows has a, you know twelve as the standard? Right? Um, All these are quite a bit above that. Yeah. So in the it doesn't necessarily reflect that. I, I can't see that. there. There there should be um, so there's a special report in the, the air quality summary that um, I think we've got the twelve. The, the annual standard of 12 micrograms, right. we've got a bar on there that kind of indicates where that is, as well as the 35, mm -hmm. the daily standard 35 micrograms, and then our, our monitoring data alongside that. So uh, we were, for much of that period, we were kind of in between the 12 and 35 with a few days above the daily standard. So this first date on that thing's around the 20th of May, I think. This I'm sorry. What's the first date on that? 15th. The first date is uh, May 15th on that one. I think we have a similar time frame plot in the special report. Uh, Mike, uh, explain how the color coding relates to the standard. Sure. So uh, the green, uh, so an AQI of 100 is. Um, equivalent to the daily standard of 35 micrograms per liter. Uh, and so basically anything in the green would be between zero and 12 micrograms per meter cube. Anything in, in yellow would be between 12 and 35 micrograms per meter cube. And then any days that are in the orange, the unhealthy or sensitive groups would be between 35 and I think 60, 65 or something like that. That help answer. It does because there's a discrepancy if it was just the same yeah. metric. Okay, know. okay. So yes, that helps. Um, so this is yeah, this is the summary for the last month or so. And then the next slide will kind of show um, what we saw PM 2.5 wise at the same time last year. So Andy, if you could go to the next slide. So yeah, this is same period last year. This is the PM 2.5 AQI values that we saw. And this is pretty typical of what we would expect this time of year. Um, a lot of green in the good category for AQI, um, some low moderate category. Uh, so obviously a, a pretty stark difference um, this year, last year for this kind of mid May to, to mid June time frame. So when you had the you know, the Oregon and California fires. Was that last summer? I feel like it's been every summer for the last few years. So they really reflected in that data there. Um, well, so we saw we saw 
some pretty significant impacts back in the summer of 2021 that were from uh, some some fires right. in the northwest and southwest Canada. That was probably the last, that was probably the last time we saw a pretty significant impact on a multi kind of day week period. And, and if you can advance to the next one, should just want to show that this. This little area, so again, this is a time period from last year, and there was a three or four day period where we did get into the upper moderate range. And that actually, that was a regional event where uh, we saw some dust from Africa travel across the Atlantic and it, it impacted um, a lot of the Southeast region. So that's just kind of an interesting site right there. Next slide, please. So those were showing the PM 2.5 AQI. So the AQI is just for particle pollution, the fine particles. This is a plot of AQI values for that for the same time period, the last month or so, that it incorporates both ozone and PM 2.5. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, there has the, the weather conditions have been right for ozone formation. We have had warm, dry weather. Uh, we had a period in Maybe the first week of June, I think, um, where we saw, I think, five days in a row where ozone did exceed that 70 uh, PPB standard. Um, and again, we had smoke in the area as well. So a pretty complex interaction that could have been enhanced some by the smoke. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the total AQI picture over the last, uh, last month or so. Next slide, please. Um, just wanted to go through a few kind of maps, just showing different kind of parts of the, the smoke impacts event over the last month. Uh, so this again was from May 18. Uh, again, most of the smoke at this time was coming from fires in Western Canada. Um, at this particular day, on this particular day, we weren't quite seeing the impact at the surface yet, but we did, we did end up seeing significant impacts at the surface just uh, four or five days after that. Uh, next slide, please. This is a map from June 6th. So this is when we started to see more of the smoke impact from the fires in Quebec. Uh, this was a time when uh, the Northeast was getting hit really hard. I'm sure you saw the headlines, New York City, uh, Director Hamilton mentioned earlier, some of the concentrations that they saw. So you see a lot of those red um, dots in and around New York City. Um, and, and we saw our fair share of smoke impacts here as well, but uh, at that time, uh, nothing like they were seeing. Next slide, please. And this is, uh, this would have been from last Thursday. And this was kind of a time frame where the smoke from, say, fires in Quebec and Ontario, and maybe even some fires that were still going on in Western Canada, were kind of all mixing together a little bit. And, um, and uh, it, it kind of, the smoke kind of sat around uh, the region, the Midwest, for, for a while. And um, we saw some pretty high concentrations um, just uh, on, on 15th, I believe. I think maybe one of the highest that we've seen from recent weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, just a second. Yeah. On this one. Uh, Go back on slide, Andy. Yeah, the colored dots on the surface, I assume those are air quality index at the surface. Yeah, air quality. Surface measurements and the gray is, is that model smoke concentration or is that from satellite? Uh, so it's actually, it's, um, it's analyzed smoke through a combination of uh, analyzing satellites and, and um, it's, I think, primarily satellite analysis. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's they're, from what I understand, they're kind of hand drawn of sorts. Um, it looks like there's a little variation uh, in uh, the values there, the darkness and lightness of the gray. So, and you, you certainly will, I think, see, you know, smoke might settle down into the valley. You'll have widespread smoke, but it could. Well, what I'm just getting at is, uh, is there any way of quantifying that? 
Is there a scale for that, or is that just kind of for the actual for the gray kind of snow? Gray, there's a light gray and a sort of a medium gray that I can see there. In different no, so this is a this that, that represent opacity or smoke concentration. I'm not 100 percent sure. Down. I'm not 100 percent sure, but they'll um, they'll generally categorize it as either light, moderate, or heavy smoke impacts. Okay. Uh, they may have uh, that's through minor. the atmosphere, right? Through that's through the total atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. So again, that's that those gray areas uh, is not necessarily a depiction of smoke at the surface. It's smoke throughout all levels of the atmosphere. That's why you do see a mix in that gray. You see a mix of green yeah. and yellow and red because the smoke is uh, coming down to the surface at only certain locations. So it's can be pretty complex, and it all depends on atmospheric mixing. Sometimes that smoke high up can be drawn down uh, to the surface at, at certain times of the day. It's, it's certainly a hard, uh, difficult thing to predict. Next slide, please. So up to this point, I've been showing you kind of daily summaries. Uh, this is just an example of um, the hourly data that you know that are available. It gives you a little a higher resolution temporally speaking. Um, this is a couple of monitors uh, that we operate: uh, Cannons Lane and Durrett Lane, as well as the Jeffersonville monitor that the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. Uh, maintains and then there's also we threw in a picture of uh, some data from a low cost sensor that uh, you know citizens can, uh, can run themselves. Um, but the general pattern is is similar with with all the monitors, so it's showing that you know this is kind of a widespread event um, and these hourly data show that. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just a couple uh, images from this was yesterday morning on the left that was uh, just showing that we were basically experiencing uh, moderate air quality yesterday morning. It did improve in the afternoon yesterday, so we were seeing good air quality throughout the, the whole little region. Um, since then, I think we bumped back up into the moderate range. We're actually still seeing some minor smoke impacts today, you know, not anything um, significant like we were seeing last week probably won't be able to see it visually as much, but, you know, looking at some of the smoke models, there are um, some minor impacts that are expected to continue today into tomorrow, hoping that, uh, I think after that, we might see a little bit of a reprieve, but as long as those fires, you know, stay active in, in Canada, if the atmospheric wind patterns are right, you know, it, it, it could bring more smoke down to our area. Next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mentioned earlier, we um, in partnership with the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, we issue daily forecasts. Um, but during these kind of regional events, we try to provide some supplemental information. Again, is that smoke that we're seeing, is that hazy sky because of smoke high in the atmosphere? near the surface. Um, so we've got our social media that we try to send some information out through. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you know, Matt Mudd, our communications uh, specialist, will try to have um, routine contact um, with each other to um, provide that, that supplemental information to supplement those air quality forecasts. Um, we have seen uh, an increase in, in, in Twitter followers, I think, um, in, the, in the last couple of weeks um, because of some, you know, some of these smoke impact information that we're distributing. Uh, and then again, of course, there's the real time air quality data that's available from Google Air Watch and the EPA uh, Air Now. We have gotten numerous requests from media um, to stay in touch with them as well. Uh, and of course, if you know, if we do believe that the smoke impact would be significant enough um, to 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 get close to that thirty-five microgram per meter cube level, we, we will issue air quality alerts, uh, and of course, we'll issue air quality alerts for ozone as well. So there have been uh, several air quality alerts that have been issued over the last uh, 
several weeks. Next slide, please. That might be it. So happy to take some, some questions from the board if there are any. Cool. Well, the you know, we're talking about the feds looking at a new standard for PM 2.5. I'm curious where that stands, if you know, and what kind of impact does events like this have? Uh, the vetting. That rule has not been finalized yet. I don't know if you have an estimate of when that might be. I don't have an estimate. Uh, the public comment period for that ended, I believe, back in March. And EPA received substantial voluminous comment uh, on the proposal, which was to change the current 12 microgram annual standard somewhere between 9 and 10. But they also took comment at 8 and 11. So apparently they got a lot of comment back. They did not propose changing the 24 hour average. Yes, if that is lower, then these events will make it uh, a little more challenging. First, I'd like to uh, thank you for a very detailed and an interesting uh, presentation around this uh, wildfire uh, smoke. In fact, I think we all aware of what we see in the news, so it's really uh, very uh, detailed. And also, you mentioned that we can go and look at fire and smoke maps. EPA, do they have a website where I could go and look at that? Yep, so it's the EPA Air Now website, and when you go to the Air Now website, um, and they've actually got a, a kind of a section highlighted in red right now. Uh -huh. That's the fire and smoke, so okay. it's a link to the fire and smoke map. Okay, so it's slightly different than the, the normal Air Now page. Right. The fire and smoke map will also include, uh, again, those, uh, it'll have those analyses of smoke, those gray kind of uh, smoke plumes that we were showing. Right. Uh, but it will also include, in addition to the monitoring data that we collect and, and report, it will also include monitoring data from low cost sensors that okay. citizens can operate. Um, and it, those, those low cost, low cost sensors, they, they need to be, I think, approved um, some, some manner before they get placed on that website. But collector of data and information. We can see local. Uh, purple air sensors on that map, and we regularly check. Okay. They're adhering to our regulatory monitors. But Ms. Katie reminded me that to your question about uh, changing standard, its impact from these smoke fires, there are provisions in the current um, EPA regulations that allow for something called exceptional events. Those are opportunities for areas that may be uh, violating standard to produce a Proposal that says this isn't because of something we did or didn't do in our local planning. And so the impact to this monitor from this event shouldn't count. Uh, that is a public process. If we were to uh, take on an exceptional event demonstration, we will advise the board and make that public commitment. Thank you. I have a question on the sensor that you showed. Is that a purple sensor? Uh, yes, yes. So it's our purple air is the Visually, it was fairly consistent with the actual monitors. Yeah, and what they what they do, um, and Tom Love can probably add a little bit more info if I'm quite accurate, but um, what they do is they, for, the, for those sensors that get on that fire and smoke map, um, I believe they also do a correction factor because um, they do have, they may have some biases, mm -hmm. but if they apply a correction factor to essentially calibrate those sensors to the air quality monitors that, that we are operating, then it, it can make those data more accurate. I mean, it's trying to explain it pretty well. But I'm not um, so yeah, I work with the uh, EPA Air Quality Exchange Group, which uh, helped develop the uh, fire and smoke map. It's not to say I didn't have anything on that line. Uh, but adding lower cost sensors was a new step as those are emerging technology, not nearly as accurate, precise as they are equipment. So currently, they are only purple air brand sensors that are on that map because that company was willing to dump most of their or share most of their proprietary technology with EPA to develop a national correction factor that brings their data more in line with regulatory models. If they still read a little higher than most regulatory monitors, if you look at the fire and smoke map, which is an outstanding flow of it, uh, you can even see locally. Some that are very close to our regulatory monitors are always getting a little bit 
required. Consistent, consistently the same. Uh, yeah, they, they show definitely the same indicative patterns on a graph. They'll just have a slight bias, number of bias to the um, But all the ones that are on fire smoke graph are aware of and are corrected in real time. Thank you. I think uh, on one of the maps, um, if you zoom into Louisville, you'll see there's some circles on there and then there's some squares. So those squares would be these low cost sensors that have circles. When we talk next month about sensors, we'll go into this a little bit more in detail. You'll bring one in, right? Um, we'll bring in some. Good example. 